it's funny. I was asked on a on, on another program about. They said, well, I think the country is too individualist because everyone is always on his phones all the time. You know, so there's a sense of like, oh, well, that's not, indivi individualism <laughs> doesn't mean that you're always on your phone all the time. And a, an individualist is, uh, paraphrasing Rand now, essentially someone who says that my life is my own and your life is your own. And I'm here to live it and pursue my own happiness and respect your individual rights and your individual liberty to, to do exactly the same. Um, you know, the, the collectivism comes when you start to not just say, but sacrifice yourself, your life, your liberty for something else, whether it's the nation. I mean, that's a pretty common one right now, actually. And that's, that's pretty surprising because most people would think, well, if, you know, don't you love the country? You're a nationalist. But you know, nationalism, as it really it's properly understood, is my country right or wrong. But it's my country because of what the country is about. And America is about a person's individual right to their own life. So, you know, it's, collectivism is almost so difficult to describe, uh, Michelle, it's just so, it's everywhere, it's where you look around us. Um, I mean, the, you know, uh, uh, I guess people's obsession with race is a really easy one right now to say like, well, well what, you know, what race are they? And that, as if that defines something, as if that says what their ideas are about. Uh, so, uh, it, so against what really American principles are all about, to look at people based on their ideas as individuals, not part of some group or tribe. Yeah. Well, you were talking about individual rights. Yes. You guys talk about this a lot in the book. Yeah. So how does Americanism define individual rights? Would that be a, a good way of putting that? Sure. Um, yeah. No, I think, I think um, you, know, you know, there's a sense now, I think, among, there's a sense that, there's a sense that Americanism is essentially whatever we vote on. That, Amer that government is majority rule. You mm -hmm. know, that you know, if, if, hey, if the majority of the people voted for it, that's what it is. And in fact, one of the articles in the book, written by a, a gentleman named uh, Greg Salmieri, talks about voting as being important about Americanism, but not the defining characteristic about Americanism. So Americanism, Americanism, true Americanism, is based on that principle, as you said, of, of individual rights. The idea, to kind of sum it up, that your life is your own, it belongs to you, that you have sovereignty, over it, and you, and those rights come not because they're given to you by a government. You know that's it's pretty common these days now to hear about. Well, if I I can join this group, I can have new rights as a as a function of being part of a group. Um, but you know, Ayn Rand and I think true Americanism would posit that rights belong to each individual because they're an individual. They're not granted by supernatural God or certainly by, by, by a government. Yeah. And that government's role, its only role, is simply to protect their right to live their own life unmolested by government. That's really radical because, as I said, in every other, every other civilization, it was, you know, what have you done for the state? You know, what have you done for the front? You know, you're, you're doing a, you're, you're a peanut farmer. You should be growing soybeans. So move over there and do that. And we're gonna point a gun at you until you did that. America said, you know, use your own mind, use your own reason, and build what you can and keep what you can. So this is like this, the basic ideas of individual rights. It's, it's just completely lost right now. So what, what, do you, what are our rights? Because you, I feel like I hear that a lot, you know, like our, our healthcare is, is, a, is a right. Yes. I have a right to, you know, what this and that. Yes. To you, what are our rights and what are not sure. our rights? Well, I mean, Ayn Rand's work is filled with this, even beyond um, textbook of Americanism. You know, I'll, I'll sum it up briefly. Mm -hmm. I think I, um, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, his work is actually also featured in here. He was Ayn, Ayn Rand's heir. His point, I think, is straight on that. You know, when we talk about a right, a right is a right to action. You know, it's something that you can do within your own sphere and your own context. A right isn't a right to like a good from someone else. It's not a right to someone, the benefit of someone else's action. So yes, within the sphere of your own, right, your own world, you have the right to your own life, your own liberty, your, your pursuit of happiness. But when you start saying as, you know, it's pretty commonplace now to say, well, you have a right, everyone has a right to healthcare, but what, what, that right is, means that someone else- You're taking it. Yeah, well, it, someone else has to produce that healthcare. Healthcare is not, doesn't, it's not, doesn't fall like an apple from a tree, although even a tree has to be, an apple has to be grown, someone has to produce that apple. So a right, think about it this way, a right is a right to action. It's a right to your action within your own sphere, not to take someone, 
something from someone else, to force someone to do something else on your behalf. Um, it's a right to your own freedom, your own life. So it's the a right is the freedom to pretty much do whatever you want in your view. Yeah. As as long as you are, would it be? Sure. Well, not interfering no. with someone else's right to do what yes, they want. Yes, exactly. Right. Rights within your individual sphere. So you know, um, you know, you you have a right to trade with someone to for a value. You don't have a right to demand that they give you that value. Even, I would say, and I, I believe a lot of our scholars in the book would say too, even if everyone votes on it. You know, um, Don, Watk, Don Watkins, who's a, another author and a scholar in the book, has a terrific article about uh, charity. Now, charity is, you know, if you said it was charity, is, is, charity, is charity a right? How about yeah. that? I mean, shouldn't the government have something for poor people? Most people would say, oh yeah, come on, we have to do something. Um, that I, I would say that's completely un-American. You know, I'd say un-American. I mean, the, the, and in fact, it's never really historically been part of the American experience and experiment. People used to say, I'd rather be dead than on the dole. But now it's just kind of seen like, well, I get my government handout, welfare, whatever You're it is. You're talking about welfare, in, uh, any element of the, safety nets. In, any element of that. Well, the irony is that the safety nets, this is the big, the sad part is the safety nets don't help anyone. They're not safe. Anyone who's on the safety net, the quote safety net now, is scared to death about its ability to actually keep them safe, whether it's Social Security or Medicare, any, you know, I mean, all these, all these, you know, when you save for yourself, that savings in your own pocket, you get to decide, right? It's your property, but Social Security isn't, or, or Medicare, any of these other things, there's no lockbox with your assets in it. It's just a promise that government's gonna violate someone else's rights in the future. And you know, that's, there's a reason why none of that uh, entitlement state, Michelle, is in any of the founding documents. The founders didn't say life, liberty, property, and health care. They would have never, never, never thought about yeah, it. Yeah, you talk about the founding fathers. So what, in this context, like what was their original intent? You guys say it was with this individualism. Yes. Yeah, I mean, what I common hear is a, is a you know, I, I often hear that people say, well, America was founded on Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. principles. I'll, you know, I'll give this an example. And the point is made pretty clearly in the book that our founders were religious, but they were basically deists. So they believed in God, but God didn't interfere. God was separated from everyday life. And they believed that essentially on earth, you know, um, you know man, God's work must truly be our own. And they, they understood that this was an opportunity for man to be free, to use his own mind, to be unmolested from government. And that's what this country, really what makes this country revolutionary is that from, you know, and it was always, whether it was the king, I mean, it was usually the king, right? The king owned everything. And it, it's, it seems so backward to us, but my God, in Saudi Arabia, it's the same thing. It's the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So you think like, how backward is that? You know, the king and so, you know, that's what, it's pretty, it's still pretty novel in many ways. True capitalism, true individualism, true, Ameri true Americanism. So, um, you know, they understood how powerful these principles were, Michelle, and that—that that was the promise of America. That. So, so they agree. They they were on the same plane of no, low, very low government interference. Yes. True, you know, freedom and individualism. So they. The, you, yes, I mean the the role of the role of of the founding documents limit government. They don't limit the people. They don't set our well. Here's what the people are allowed to do. Uh, because government says so, and the whole role, the nature of, gov of the American style of government is that the role of government is very limited. Uh, you know, Ayn Rand is, writes about this, and she writes about it very effectively in, in Textbook of Americanism. You know, government's role is very specific. It's not just whatever we decide, whatever the, the public wants, mm -hmm. and that's the thing since then. Well, if we, if we need roads, government can do that. If we need healthcare, government can do that. I mean, because what is government? What is it? I mean, it's, right. You tell me. It's a, it's a gun. I mean, it sounds like, oh, what are you talking about? Government is all the good things we get. Now, I mean, go back to where we started. You know, there's two ways to do things, trade or force. So when I go to get a milkshake, you know, I give the $4, I get that's trade. But when government says, you know, we want to build a road or, or we want to give someone health care, they don't, they don't ask. They come and they point a gun at you and you either give them the, it's not $4, it's more like 40% of every dollar you make. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of your life. They don't ask, they just take. So, um, you know, that's the basic principle of what government is, government's force. And I think the founders really knew that. Ayn Rand certainly understood that, that 
the necessity of limiting that force, defining that force, specifying that force, and leaving man free, because that's, you know, where does, where does, where do values come from, ultimately? I mean, this, this, Ayn Rand, we get into a little bit in the book, but, you know, Ayn Rand, ultimately, I believe, is a real respect for man's reason, for man's mind, because that's where everything comes from. Do you ever look at something, Michelle, and be like, my God, how did they, how did they come up with that? Mm -hmm. like, so ingenious. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's the ma magic of man's mind. And I feel like in America, you know, that, you know, like we talk about it in the book, you know, is, is, is capitalism efficient? Is dictatorship efficient? It sounds pretty basic, but there are people who advocate for dictatorship now, openly right. in this country. They might not call it, they call it national socialism. You know, they don't, no one ever, because whatever they always say, like, oh, that wasn't real socialism, it was fake, so De something else. Democratic right. socialism. Yeah, it's just, oh, this is democratic right socialism. Now. So there's all these other, it's, it's, you're either free or you're not. It's individualism or collectivism. And individual, it's individualism and then basically everything else. Yeah, well, okay, so on that note about, let's say, like, like taxation you were talking about, you're yeah. saying the government um, is essentially a gun because yes. in order to do anything or whatever they implement to get their citizens to abide by that, they, there has to be force, which is either by imprisonment, it's right? All it can do. Or, it's all um, I mean, pretty much imprisonment. It's all, it's all, go that's all government can do, right? It can, it is force at all. Um, but you brought up uh, examples of, say, roads, infrastructure. What about things like that? I've heard some people bring up the argument of, um, you know, we talked, we were talking earlier about like the big, big, big buildings that people are, are building and all these great things that they're uh, innovating because of the freedom that they have. Sure. But then I've heard people say, well, what about the roads it takes to get those supplies? They always there use the roads. And that. You know, yeah. the thing is because we had no choice in the roads. So they would say, you couldn't have built that building unless I built the roads. First of all, it's so untrue because, I mean, the best recent example is Domino's, maybe about a year ago, had an offer to start filling potholes in, in cities, you know, based on, the, you know, offering to do that. Wait, I mean, tell me about that. I didn't know, I don't know about I, that. Essentially, I'd say Google it, but this notion that only government can build roads, but, but private citizens can build huge skyscrapers and buildings is so unbelievable. And I'll just point to real world examples, if nothing else, I mean, to get into a whole discussion of privatization. First of all, this country has a history of private roads, private bridges, private infrastructure. And um, throughout Europe, uh, highways are privatized. Highways are privatized, even the Chicago Skyway, which is a major highway, are, are privatized. So this, for some reason, this notion that you know, government has to own all the roads, I think we have a long way to go before we get there. I mean, that's, that's important. I think it's a relatively private, uh, uh, sorry, relatively minute element. But this notion that oh, only government can build roads and so only government can provide health care is so backward wrong. And just quickly to use your example of the, um, the buildings, I mean, you know, in America, by and large, development, property development is private. So the buildings go up, they're privately financed, and they're filled when they go up. They're really, very rarely are they empty. Go to China with all the government ghost cities, if you've, I'm sure you've read about mm. those. That's what happens when government puts up, starts getting into infrastructure. You build the bridges to nowhere. And this is, this is such a recent example in places as, you know, from the Far East to I mean, Japan historically, you know, that, that's what basically... Yeah, well, can you, can you go a little bit more into depth sure. on that for maybe people who don't know? Sure, um, examples but of... China... Sure, I mean, I mean you, know, um, you know, what causes the road to be built? You know, before the businessman, before the entrepreneur, before capitalism, there's no reason for a road. There is no road. Um, you know, it all starts with the, capital, with the capitalist, the person who's going to create the values. And that's, that's, you know, I'll just quickly tally back, you know, to the book. Like, it's, we still have that idea of only in America. And it is true, only in America. Why do all the exciting new companies come up in Silicon Valley, come up in, in America? Only in America do we have, still have that kind of free. And that's why I'm not giving up this country um, at all. But, um, you know, people spend their own money wisely. They spend it to pursue their own values. They pursue it for their own selfish economic pleasure. Government spends money for political reasons. It spends money because it has to make jobs. We hear that a lot these days. That used to be kind of on the left. Now it's very much on the right as well. Um, why, how, why, how do you think? Well, that's what, you know, we're gonna have, we're gonna have Republicans who are gonna be endorsing infrastructure spending mm. uh, as a means of creating jobs. So it's a means of you know, taking money from people who earned it and giving it to people for projects that maybe would get built, maybe wouldn't get built. I promise you would get built in much more 
efficient fashion and ultimately long-term beneficially fashion. Um, but, you know, it kind of goes back to, you know, what we said just a moment ago that, you know, well, is just government something that could do whatever it's want? I mean, my God, Elon Musk is sending people into space privately. Don't tell me that he can't build a, build a road. It's just, it's like bizarre. Only government can build a road. Well, but, but these few guys can build rocket ships to the moon, but they can't handle roads. Of course they can handle roads. So, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, government is a very important, very vital role. In fact, actually, in the book as well, Alain Journo, who we both know, has been a guest on your mm -hmm. on your show, um, very interesting guest, has a fascinating chapter on foreign policy. That's the role of government. Michelle, I can't get a tank. I can't go fight Islamists in the Middle East or wherever. I can't... Uh, I can't go pursue criminals and shake them down. Or if someone comes and burglars my home, I can't get a gang together and say, all right, well, let's go find them, guys, and string off. No, we need government. So oftentimes people say, oh, you're into Ayn Rand, so you just think no government, no government. Ayn Rand understood, very importantly, the role of government, the essential role of government. We should be thankful we have government, but not any government, this government. I don't mean the Trump administration, of course. <laughs> I mean the American style of government. You know, that's just, as, as I said, you know, the American principle of individualism. There's a, the point made in the book. I love this that you know, you go shopping, go to a mall, and you go in, you buy merchandise, you come out, and how do you know that you're not going to get ransacked? That like the the mob's not going to turn on you. She bought something, grab it. How do you know that that's not going to happen? Well, it's because we understand we live in a civil society where people's property rights are protected. And go to Venezuela. That happens all the time now. There's just rampant crime. There's no protect for, there's no respect for anyone's rights, basic rights. It starts very slowly, but it starts with those basic questions we talked about that, you know, you have a right to your own life. I write actually in the book about the estate tax. That's a pretty big one now. People say, oh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, why does he need to have such a big company? Why does he need to have so much influence? Why does he need to have so much money? You know, wouldn't we all be better off if we just separated his company, separated some of his money? It's, it's not ours. There is no us. It's his. It's his. And the basic respect of that, uh, loss of respect of property. And that's, you know, it's like slavery and individual rights. You said before, you know, talk to me, like define individual yeah. rights. Well, I mean, you know, if you work at a job, people say like, oh, my boss is such a slave driver. But we all know you can tell your boss to stuff it, walk out, go find another job. Um, slave can't do that. Right. There's a level of consent there. There's every saying. level of consent. I mean, they, you know, in fact, you know, one of the things I talk about, I talk about in the book is, is something as benign as the minimum wage. We would think like, oh, you know, we, we really do need a minimum wage. This is that. It's, it's not even nanny state. It's, it's, um, it's I just destruct. It's destructive. I mean, the minimum wage is destructive specifically to young, unemployed, unskilled people. Those people who are just getting started, just want to get that first job. I worked at Starbucks. I told you that story. Mm -hmm. Something tells me you probably did something. Mm -hmm. Right? We all did. We worked that first entry level job to get us the skills to move up the ladder. But minimum wage is a. It's a. It's discrimination against that. It says you know unless I can hire you for fifteen dollars an hour, I can't hire you at all. Some jobs are not worth it. Yeah, well, not fifteen dollars well, an hour. Sure. So, so because we've actually had people on to make the case for minimum wage, why? What is your case against it? Obviously, this one. Well, you more just than said. anything, that you uh, to go back to what you said, this mm -hmm. is voluntary consent. This is Americanism. You own your life, and if you want to go work a job for three or four or five dollars or no dollars, you know, I work jobs for low money. I also interned. I did, in, I did internships yeah. for free. Yeah. And those were pretty valuable to you, my guess is they- It you, turned into a job. Turned actually. into a job, exactly. So, I mean, I mean, there's so many stories of that, of, I mean, Steve, um, Steve Jobs going and working for Bill Hewlett, I believe. I'm probably massacring. I know you have an Apple fans. Uh, you know, did he have to get official paperwork? I mean, a job is a, is a mutually beneficial relationship. So for the government to come in and say like, no, 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 no. We've got to be part of this. We've got to make sure that you get this and you get that. It's, it's such an insult to any, anyone who'd say, you know, would say like, wait, I, I, I want to take this job. He's offering this opportunity. I want to take it. Or the, the person who wants to hire them and say like, no, I, I want to hire this individual. So I mean, the, you know, government has no role in deciding what choices I make with my life, who I hire, where I work, how much I work for. That's, you know, what an insult to any, anyone. On both sides yeah. of the trade. What, what, do you, what do you think about the argument of workers being exploited? 
the potential for that if they if there's no one fighting for them that they're gonna have to work 50 hours a week or 50 we'll say like 100 hours a week for you know two dollars an hour and sure. they have families or whatever like what do you think about well it's I, I would say this no I mean I, I believe that you're gonna have to work in America that is one of the beautiful things about America is that nothing is guaranteed. You have no right to a job, right to an income. Uh, that's the exciting thing about America is that you are free. So I think there is this sense, unfortunately, and I, I don't, I don't, you know, it's been taught for a lot of time, uh, for many, many years, that you know people grow up with that sense of like, well, I, I'm entitled to some basic living. You're entitled to what you what values you can create and you can produce. And what inevitably ends up happening is is that most people get those skills, build those skills, create those skills, create those opportunities. And, you know, if someone, you know, if someone can't take care of himself, if someone makes terrible choices in their life, they have, this is me speaking now, certainly not on Rand, but I believe if someone makes, has, you know, a dozen kids that they can't take care of, they make terrible choices, they don't get educated at all in any skill, and not just talking about higher education, they don't better themselves in any way, you know what, they, they're the ones who should be most for, for capitalism because they're the ones who need charity. You know, they're the ones, they can't expect anyone else to be obligated to provide for them. So then that would imply that capitalism helps charity? Cap capitalism helps everybody. I mean, where, you know, where do you want to be, where, you know, where do you want to be poor? Let's put it this way. I mean, mm. if you, First of all, this, this idea of there has to be the poor is such BS. You know, we, the poor is, it's a, um, I don't believe in it. I don't believe in it. Actually, I think it's a rather collectivist idea. The poor. Yeah. I think it's, you know, Americans, when we started talking about America is about individuals, individual people making their own choices. And you know what? People who are part of the poor, a lot of them aren't the poor for very long. They pull themselves out. I mean, I don't have the stories. How many, there's ad infinitum. We could go on and on about people who've pulled themselves out of terrible situations to become huge successes. That is the American dream. It's not dead by any means. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe. And two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.